and good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Judith Batchelor. Um, I have uh, recently moved on from um, 40 years spent uh, working in agriculture, food manufacturing and retailing. And I'm very grateful um, to the BNF for inviting me this morning to come and talk about the global food system that I uh, love and, and have loved working in for that time, but also to share some of the insights around that global food system, um, particularly in light of the things that Judy's just talked about in terms of what creates a healthy and sustainable diet. And I want to begin with looking at um, the system with a number of different lenses on it, because one of the challenges we've got in the food system is that it's a system. But historically, we've looked at this system through single lenses, through single issues. And of course, that is not going to solve some of the problems that we have at the moment, because they are all interrelated, interdependent. So whether it's um, the issue of plastic and microplastics in our oceans and the fact that by 2050 there will be a greater weight of plastic in the ocean than there are fish in the ocean, whether it's around the billions of tonnes of food that we waste every year that could be put to much better use. And that's not just the waste of the food, but the resources that went into producing that food, whether it's the um, extraction of fresh water for agriculture, so on and so forth. The system that we have today is not fit for the future and the future population requirements that, that Judy just described in her introduction. So um, what are we gonna do about it? Well, the first thing to say is it is complicated. And, and this next slide shows, hopefully, Thank you. Um, this next slide shows global shipping routes just for agricultural commodities. And um, this is before COVID, and we all know what happened then. But global shipping routes um, for agricultural commodities have grown um, or quadrupled in the last 10 years, which means all of this food is being moved around the globe um, in a way that is just in time. And that causes all sorts of other challenges. And we're seeing that play out now, actually, with availability and some of the things that are going on with those just-in-time supply chains. But also, um, those, those supply chains create a lot of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And if you add agriculture to food production, that's nearly 30% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and you could say, well, actually, is the answer to that buying local? Um, but that's not as simple as that, because when you look at where those greenhouse gas emissions come from in the supply chain, and you can see it broken down there, supply chain, livestock, crop production, and land use, by far the biggest impact of our food system is in the agricultural part of the food system. And in fact, that's not just true for food, it's true for non-food as well. If you start to look at things like clothing, cotton, um, rubber, in leather, though all of those commodities um, start their life as agric all those products start their life as agricultural commodities with this massive footprint. So it's not just what you source, it's how it is produced that is important. And if you hold that thought, um, I'll come back to that later. Um, but not only have we got this global system that is highly um, complicated, it's also highly fragmented and highly consolidated, um, both of those things, which create interesting points of um, consolidation within the supply chain itself. So on the left-hand side, um, we have got 500 million smallholder farmer households around the world. Mm -hmm. Um, these are farmers that are farming less than five hectares, five acres rather. They're living on less than $2 a day, but they are producing huge quantities of global commodities. In fact, 35% of what we consume comes from smallholder producers. Unfortunately, these smallholder producers are the people that are going to disproportionately be impacted by climate change and the climate change that they did not help to create. Um, and we call this 
focus, the, the race to resilience. So what are we going to do to help these smallholder producers adapt to, I say, the climate change that they did not help to create? And yes, we need to be doing that. And yes, we need to be financing that. And that was a lot of what was discussed at COP26. But also there's the challenge of how you reach those um, smallholder producers and you give them the help and, and reward that they need to carry on doing what they're doing. And that includes sharing science, knowledge and best practice when actually the root of them is highly consolidated. So the piece on the right hand side shows the top 10 global brands that we all consume um, every day and that we're all very familiar with. Um, if I was to change that to be the top 10 food businesses, then there would be um, names that weren't quite so familiar in there. So people like the ADMs, the Bungies, the Cargills, the big global commodity traders that, again, control the commodities that we then consume. So again, it's, it's a big system, um, but it's got really big structural challenges that we need to think about how we overcome. But the good news is um, we may be a small part of that system, but actually some of the research and science that we're doing in this country, whether it's the environmental sciences around microplastics, the British Antarctic Survey, whether it's um, the biological sciences and some of the things that, that Guy Poppy will talk about later, we lead the way in that scientific research. And I know the National Food Strategy um, document, the plan that Henry Dimbleby and his team produced is not the official government um, uh, national food strategy, but we've got a white paper coming from DEFRA after um, Christmas, hopefully, that will lay out a really ambitious plan for the UK food system that will be world leading. I, I'm confident of that. So there are some really good signs, but of course all of these things are in their infancy and we need to move faster and we need to move at scale if we're going to meet the challenge of both climate and nature. But what customers eat is a massive part of that solution. And if we could only um, move people to a healthier diet and a more sustainable diet, that would make a big impact on that 30%. But interestingly, you talk about healthy and sustainable diets, but our diets need to not just be healthy and sustainable, they need to be restorative because basically um, sustaining what we've got now is not good enough. Um, we need regenerative agriculture. We, re we need restorative practices. Um, but, but what customers eat is complicated. Um, if it was easy, we wouldn't all be sitting here today, would we? We would be, be um, clapping and, and euphoric about the fact that we were all eating um, what a healthy diet is. Um, but there are, um, I say challenges, but there are also opportunities in this. So um, what this graph shows is, um, for these countries, and there are a lot more countries, but I picked these because it's quite interesting, um, what you've got is the dark line, which shows what the carbon emissions would be if those countries were to follow their national dietary guidelines. So if they were to eat what was being recommended by their national governments. And then the lighter line is actually the carbon emissions from the diet that, that is actually being consumed in those countries. And we would be no different from that. Um, and that's the good news, actually, because um, this is what we're eating today on the left-hand side. You'll be familiar with that. That is the Eat Well Guide on the right-hand side. If we were to eat the Eat Well Guide, that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 31%, land use by 34%, water use, and we haven't even begun to talk about water, um, and it would also improve um, healthy life years, so disability-adjusted life years. So that, that's great, but that's only greenhouse gas emissions. A, a diet that is um, healthy in terms of greenhouse gas emissions isn't necessarily better for the environment. So it's not just about what we eat and what that emits, but also how we source it, where we source it from, and how the people in those supply chains are treated. Um, I'm showing this because actually, we congratulate ourselves, quite rightly, on doing quite a good job on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. 
Um, this is from RAP. They've done some brilliant work in this space, particularly in trying to measure more accurately greenhouse gas emissions. It also shows what food waste um, and, and what that's targeting. But what it shows is that actually in 2019, based on a 2015 baseline, the greenhouse gas emissions from the UK food system decreased by 8%. And, and actually, we are doing quite a good job. Um, not as good a job as we need to do, but we are doing quite a good job. But that's kind of the elephant in the room, because actually, if you look at per capita, so for every person in the UK, our CO2 emissions are coming down. Um, when you start to look at what we're actually consuming in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, so this is the emissions from our food system, less the food that we export, but adding in the food that we import, um, our greenhouse gas emissions from a consumption point of view are not going down. So we are not changing our behaviours to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We are just offshoring our greenhouse gas emissions to those people who are producing food on our behalf in other parts of the world. So the answer does lie with all of us and what we eat and what we consume. And that's not just food, that's all sorts of other commodities. Um, I would recommend this website. It's called Our World in Data, and you can get lost for hours in, in that website, um, but it's excellent. Um, so how do we make sure that we make every calorie that we are eating count and that we um, are putting the right thought into this? And, and again, general theme for the day, I think. This is not easy, it's complicated. So, um, the graph on the left-hand side, bar chart rather, shows mean greenhouse gas emissions per 100 grams of food. And I think what's in there is exactly what you would expect. It shows the emissions from agriculture processing, transport, packaging, and retailing. And there you are, meat, um, red meat, milk and dairy products are where you would expect them to be with a bigger footprint. But of course, we don't eat food um, in 100 grams lots. We eat food in portions and we eat food in calories. Um, so if you were to look at this from an energy point of view, so this is the same thing, but with um, adjusted towards 100 calories. So um, what are the greenhouse gas emissions per calorie that you're consuming? Then clearly um, the, the, the graph changes because um, the calories that you get from fruit and veg are not the um, same calories that you get from meat and so on and so forth. If you then take that a step further and say, well, not all of those calories are equal and what does the nutrient density look like? Then you get something like this, which shows, and um, this is the ND6, but if you were to look at ND15, you'd get similar kind of thing that actually it's not quite as clear as, as we thought it was. And if we are truly thinking about making every calorie count, then we need to be a lot more thoughtful and we need to be a lot more probing around what those calories look like and what return we're getting for those greenhouse gas emissions. The other elephant in the room is, if you imagine that you could wave your magic wand and everybody in the world would be eating that healthy diet or, and everybody would be eating um, according to their national dietary guidelines, um, then fundamentally the world doesn't produce what the world should be eating. So there is a big disconnect between supply side and demand side. Um, and we would call that the push and the pull. So um, what the world is eating is the pull and what the world is producing is the push. Um, and we need to get that right, because if everyone did want to eat um, what they should be eating, then we, we wouldn't have those foods to hand. And that gap between supply and demand is big. And you can see it here, whether it's fruit and veg, whether it's dairy, milk products, so on and so forth. So, so what are we going to do about that? Um, so I think there are two big questions that we collectively have to answer, and I'm hoping by the end of the day we will be a bit closer to answering these two questions. One is, how do we agree on what the to-be world looks like? What is a healthy and sustainable and hopefully 
um, regenerative diet look like? And how do we manage a fair transition to that in this world where we've got millions of smallholder farmers, we've got different um, challenges, geopolitical challenges, and what is right in one part of the world isn't necessarily what's right in the other part of the world, because we, we do need to get going on this. So um, the first thing is um, we need to agree on what a healthy and sustainable regenerative diet looks like. And you will all know, I suspect if I spoke to every single one of you, both here and um, virtually, about what you believe to be a healthy and sustainable diet, we would get lots of different answers. And that's not helpful to consumers, to customers. We need to get to a consensus of some accepted wisdom on the things that we can talk about. Um, so, you know, what is the um, sustainable uh, regenerative equivalent of five a day that we all can believe would be a good thing? And I use this example of red meat because it's a classic of what's going on at the moment. And, and I, I don't know what the answer is because I'm not an expert on, on this, but I know that it's confusing. And when we've done research with customers, a lot of customers would say, I, I really do want to make some more sustainable choices, but I don't know how to do that because what is out there um, is, is confusing, it's inconsistent, and even the experts don't agree. So one of well, my asks is, you know, what are we all going to do about that? What are we going to do to help people who want to make more sustainable choices to do so? Um, and what does that transition look like? Um, and the thing I wanted to talk about here was stealth um, versus active choices. Um, and I put this slide up not to show the fact that we've done a great job on reducing um, fats, saturates, etc., in products over the years, which we have, by the way, and we should congratulate ourselves collectively that we have driven a really good reformulation programme, um, and, and not the fact that the portion sizes have gone up at the same time, which kind of negates some of that. But the point is that we can do it. Um, and we can do it by stealth. And it's that question that says, if customers knew what we know, and we know a lot more, um, what would they expect us to do? And we should just get on and do that. Um, and if it's true for reformulation of products from a nutrition point of view, it's also true from an environmental point of view and a climate change point of view. We, we know some of these things. And we shouldn't wait for the market to pull that. We should just get on and do it because it's right. And, and to be fair, we have. We've got Marine Stewardship Council fish that is sustainable. We've got deforestation free supply chains and high tech solutions that mean we can assure those supply chains. But we need to do more. Um, but we also know what works in terms of incentivizing customers. So some amazing um, track records of performance in things like using, um, in this case, Sainsbury's Nectar Points to incentivize customers to eat more fruit and veg and using very, very targeted, specific ways to increase people's consumption. And we know measuring that and continuing to incentivize that, those behaviors stick over long periods of time and we can measure that. Um, the same with giving people inspiration around um, great tasting food. Um, a lot of work done with the, the World Resources Institute on how vegetarian options are described and actually the uplift you see when you actually don't talk about something being a vegetarian or a vegan product. You just talk about how delicious it is and you use lovely evocative um, photography. And linked to that... Um, Probably my favourite subject is the topic of data and labelling. And the whole piece around data and labelling is um, we don't have it. And you, you all know, because you've lived through nutrition labelling, that getting to a definition of what fibre is, um, agreeing the methodology for testing for fibre, and then agreeing what those typical values look like so that we can create a nutrition label, took us the best part of 25 years. And we haven't got 25 years to work out what that looks like for carbon and environmental labeling. We need to get on with it now. And, and that doesn't exist 
there, there are no standards either in the UK or globally. There are no definitions. Um, and that means it's a bit like the Wild West out there. And that's not good because we know, according to some work from Deloitte, that 67% of customers want to make sustainable, more sustainable choices, but they don't know how to, and we can't give them that information. I'm hopeful there'll be something in the white paper on this. I don't know. I'm keeping my fingers crossed because this is the big unlocker. So think back to that chart that showed consumption, emissions based around our consumption, and the fact that we eat, we eat more healthily, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and impact. Um, if we can label products at a product level that enable customers to make choices at a product level, and, and that labeling is, is accurate, consistent, standardized, and indeed even embedded in a, in a uh, barcode, then actually we, we are halfway there to helping customers who want to do those things. Um, there's lots of things out there, as I say, um, lots of people assessing this, um, and the jury's still out on what that might look like, but um, the research that, that I've done historically in this space, or um, we've done at Sainsbury's, would say that MTL-style approaches are the ones that customers like, but that's because <laughs> we've probably trained them well with nutrition labelling. Um, but there's a, a, lot, a lot of space to go on this one. So, in summary, um, I'm, I've probably um, got the message across, I hope, that the food system is um, complicated. It needs to undergo a massive transformation to enable everyone to eat better. Um, data and technology are probably the big enablers, and not just labelling, but how we look at those supply chains, because it's not just the what, it is the how those products are sourced, and particularly the agricultural part of the supply chain. Um, but good science, transparency and rigour are really key to this. And I think that's, that's about all of us and the role that we play in making sure that we can reach a consensus on what a healthy, sustainable and regenerative diet looks like. Um, we know that for an increasing number of people, the food choices they make and the pounds that they spend in a supermarket are a vote for the kind of world they want to see in the future. So I'd like to think that we can all play our part in making that a reality. Thank you.